Es peregrinos. Caminos. Buen camino. We're going to Spain um, for a very long walk. Um, I think it helps to understand the context of why the Camino was created. Um, the Camino uh, is, as I have said, a very long walk. And it's a punishment. It started as a punishment. So if you were in one of the many small communities, and that's all there were back in the Middle Ages, and you committed some grievous sin, the step that the first transnational corporation took against you, the first transnational corporation being the Holy Roman Catholic Church, <laughs> the step that they took to correct you was to excommunicate you. Now, we may have all heard about excommunication, but excommunication meant what it, what it sounds like. The community was off limits to the sinner. That meant no one transacted with you, no one spoke to you, no one related to you, no one supplied you. And so it usually didn't take too long before you were on your knees in the church in front of the priest. And then you received your penance. And one of the possible penances, if you've done something really grievous, is that you might be sentenced to a compostella. A compostella meant that you were to immediately go to your house, take a few possessions, and start walking from wherever you were in Europe to the Cathedral of St. James at Santiago de Compostela on the western, western? western edge of Spain, that part of Spain that extends out over Portugal. Um, in a province called Galicia, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that. So there were three pilgrimages at the time. There was Rome, uh, Jerusalem, and Santiago. So you might receive but the worst penance that I ever heard was a person who was sentenced to three Jerusalems on his knees. And he made it. Can you believe that? Now, there is still this flavor of trial. I mean, it was a trial. You know, if you went and received your scallop shell and came back, well, you were forgiven and you were entitled to resume your role in the community. Of course, you were completely changed if you made it through that journey in that time. Um, but now we still have this sense that you know, I think what I want to do is I want to challenge myself. And so many people these days undertake this walk along this historic corridor uh, in the interests of meeting up with adventure, finding themselves spiritually. Who knows how many reasons there might go. Some of the, uh, I was mentioning to someone earlier that some of the Germans go there with the idea that they're going to show everyone that they can get there faster and more efficiently than everybody else. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so the trail is classically, um, and, and I, I can't claim to have done the classic experience, the classic experience is to start in Saint Jean-Pierre-de-Port in France. It's on the other side of the Pyrenees from the body of Spain. And so you go there and you start have your passport stamped. Everyone carries a little passport, which entitles you to the privileges of the Camino, including staying in the refugios, which who are the, the, the little hostels along the way you can room in. You and 40 of your closest friends in a, an intimate room like this. Uh, and uh, so you can do that. You can, and it also tells people at the end of the line that with your stamped passport, which becomes, of course, a matter of honor to collect as many stamps as you can, that you have done the route and you, you can prove that you were there. Um, so there are several routes, and the paths which still exist join Santiago with almost every community in Europe. 
because that's how it originated with Sassica, as a route from every place in Europe down to, down to Santiago. Um, the main routes that people walk today are the one called the Camino Frances, which is the route from Saint-Jean-Pierre-de-Port across the, the, the middle of the, of the northern portion of Spain. And the uh, other routes, there are many other routes, but there's a route that friends of mine just finished called the Camino del Norte, which is along the seashore of the uh, Bay of Biscay. And it's very rigorous. Um, but all, you know, wonderful prospects of the sea and all this kind of stuff. So it may seem like it's sort of a hard thing, and people set themselves up to think, this is going to be really hard. i got to really kind of, you know, get my teeth gritted and all the rest of it. What it proves to be is something entirely different. Um, so after a day's travel on a typical Camino day, the pilgrim arrives, produces the credential, which is the passport, uh, showing that they're an official pilgrim. Our credentials for Canadians are issued by uh, the Canadian, I think it's still called the Confraternity of St. James, but it's, um, uh, it's accessible at santiago.ca. If you want to get a Canadian passport, you go to santiago.ca. And there is a, an active chapter here in, in Calgary that will, uh, will produce your, your credential. So you arrive and then you stay in the refugio most of which are maintained by the municipalities along the way. And this burden of hospitality, the northern Spanish people have gladly accepted for a thousand years. And it is remarkable to know that they have not become cynical. They are welcoming, they are joyous, they are uh, helpful, wonderful, wonderful people as hosts of this experience. And another thing that, that is true about it is it is the least expensive European holiday you could ever imagine going on. <laughs> because the, the refugios are often um, 10 euros a night. And the meals along the way are pilgrims' meals that are often offered for 10 or 12 euros for the meal. And it's, a, it's just, you can't spend enough money. Um, so. Uh, it's very reasonable. The food is hearty. The way is populated with people from all over the world who are walking together toward the cathedral. And so every morning when you wake up, you join the stream of people that are on their way to the cathedral. And it's not at the beginning, when you, if you start from reasonably far away as I did the last time, it's not, um, it's not a heavy uh, crowd. It's quite spacious, there's lots of room. Um, but when you get closer in, as my friend Bob, who walked with me in the last one, said, he said, this is like a crowd walking into a football game. <laughs> and yet, it did nothing to spoil or ruin the connection that we were enjoying at that time. Um, so let's see where I am. <laughs> um, so the logistics, well, everybody wants to know how it works. You go to Saint-Jean-Pierre-de-Port, or you go to Leon, which is in the center of Spain, or you go to, to Osobrero, which is the high point in Galicia, if you want to do a shorter version, or Saria, if you want to do the very shortest version. And you get there by conventional transport. Uh, you, know, you fly to here or there. Um, the first time that we went, we went to Santiago, to Compostela Airport, and we said, don't show us the cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> and we went that way out of town to go backwards up to Osobrero to start. Um, the, uh, aside from the, the credential, which you need, you need to have equipment. The first time that we went, we thought we were going to sort of Lawrence of Arabia's Spain. So we had all sorts of things like hats with, you know, neck shelters because the sun is going to beat down on us and all this kind of stuff. And this was in the very, very early days of the internet. And my friend who went with me, Derek Bullen, who is a very tech-savvy guy, about five days, I think it was, before we were scheduled to get on the plane, found out that you could look up weather for distant places on the, uh, on the Google. You know? So he, he looked up weather for Santiago. 55 rain, 55 rain, 55 rain, 55 rain. 
uh, we just made a discovery. We were going to Ireland, not Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> so we raced down to Mountain Equipment Co-op and bought every kind of keep dry thing we could possibly get, including Gore-Tex socks, if you can believe it. And, and we were actually filmed on Galicia TV. And, and I don't know why the Europeans like to do this, but they have this crazy thing about people who are on TV should do something silly. And so they had us dancing around each other like this, showing off our Gore-Tex socks. And who knows where that clip is? I'd love to find it. Um, but uh, uh, so you, you, you walk. You stay in the refugios, generally. Um, I didn't uh, the third time. I went on the executive Camino. And the executive Camino means that you can stay in two and three-star hotels along the way. And you still can't spend enough money to make any difference. Um, and this is the real payoff. You can have your bag schlepped by Yakotrons every day. So they will take your bag and they will drop it off at your destination. And you arrive and there's your bag and you've gone all day with just your day pack on. Now this makes a big difference when you get to a certain age. You know, It's just a hell of a lot easier to walk without the burden. But my friend Bob, he insisted, he wanted to carry it all, so he had his 20 kilo pack and more power to him. Um, and the other thing you probably want to equip yourself with when you go is training. Because this is a very long walk. And so, you know, if you're not trained up, it's going to break you down. Um, and we see lots of people who are experiencing real physical difficulty along the way, and we did, both of us did, uh, as we got toward the tail end of our 350 kilometers. Um, but training is a very important part of this, to get used to the idea of carrying a load walking a long way, because we're doing, of an average, uh, 25 kilo kilometers a day, some days 30. And that's day after day after day. So it's a, it's a bit of a physical try. Um, that said, that all disappears very, very quickly. Um, let's see. The Camino is not exclusively for Catholics. It's open to the rest of the world, and the church is very welcoming. Uh, it has a churchy character. You know, there's, there's lots of attention to churches and venerable churches along the way. You'll see one here. But it's an ecumenical trek. And what I want to try and get to this morning is to make sure that you have the feeling of a, a, a group of pilgrims united in spirit walking together. And it's a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous experience, a joyous occasion. You arrive at the uh, cathedral, the great cathedral of St. James in Santiago de Compostela. And if you time it right, you can go to the 11 o'clock Pilgrim's Mass. And uh, at the 11 o'clock Pilgrim's Mass, they swing the Boat of Fumero. And the Boat of Fumero is this gigantic incense burner. Because in the good old days, the pilgrims used to arrive there, and they were not what we would call friendly. Because they'd had a long walk, and they were unwashed by and large. So they'd light this Boat of Fumero, and then they that, you know, in the middle of this, my great friend Rick Eigenbrod turns to me and he says, we do good church, don't we? <laughs> so this thing starts up and then it's, it's propelled by a bunch of monks on ropes and they swing it throughout the entire church from apse to apse. So it's like hundreds of feet in the air. And of course, everybody you know, cheers and so it's very unchurchy in that way. Um, so let me show you a few things here. Yeah, why? I think that's the question that's interesting and one that changes over the duration of the trip. Um, so here are um, the various routes and this is the classic route here. The Camino Frances, you can see it says that right there. Um, starting from here over the Pyrenees, and boy, what a way to start, because if you do that, you're climbing right up over a very high pass with your first day, and then back down to 
um, this town, which has a very interesting pronunciation. It's, it's not even here. Roncesvalles. Bios. And Roncesvalles Bios has a very historic, wonderful chapel in it. I know all this because I talked to lots of Camino Peregrinos and through Pamplona, Logroño, Burgos, and then across a very desolate sector called the Meseta, which is sort of like walking from here to Hannah. Um, not much more decorous than that. Um, however, people tell me it has its own majesty. And I got on at Leon and walked from Leon into Santiago de Compostela. Bob carried on to Finisterre and finished his, uh, his pilgrimage there. And I'll read a poem about Finisterre later. Um, so, <clears throat> how many here uh, have done the Camino? Wonderful, wonderful. How many feel called to do the Camino? Wow. <laughs> well, I hope that this will cement that for you. We'll see. Um, these are some of the uh, possibilities for how it comes to you. Um, a lot of people saw the movie The Way with Martin Sheen. And it's a really, you know, it's dramatized, but it's a really fair um, uh, and helpful idea about the nature of the journey. Um, you need the passport, you need the boots, and all that kind of stuff, and you need the train up. So, um, when, oh, oh yeah. May to October, best. What to expect? <laughs> Altitude, glory, heat, boredom, green, rain, resolution. Um, the network, you understand that. I've already spoken about that. And here we are. I went from here. That's the center of, uh, I think it's the Hyatt in Atlanta, to here. The cathedral in Leon which is a majestic cathedral. And there's Bob and I just kind of getting revved up. <laughs> it's our typical fuel of choice, vino bianco. <laughs> and if, you know, you can do anything you want on the Camino. So one of our little rebellions was vino bianco, 1030. There we go. <laughs> By that time, we'd already been on the trail for five hours, you know, so. <laughs> Ready to go. And here we are. Walking out of Leon on simple roads, simple byways, through the fields. That's a lot of what it's like. And meeting characters. And boy, do you ever meet wonderful character people. This fellow here, an Irishman, who is a great character. And we were having a discussion. Of course, there's this wonderful book by Briarly, it's the, bur the sort of Bible of the Camino. I don't know whether you used it or not. But, but uh, anyway, Briarly has all of this authoritative pronouncements about this and that, about the Camino. And, and, uh, and so we were talking about that with this fellow and saying that, uh, uh, you know, the area we were going to wasn't really, uh, that wasn't really the way it was described in Briarly. And he says, hmm, you know what? The book. <laughs> so, we do. Um, these are the old Camino markers that tell you how far away you are. And you can see that they are laden with symbolic um, material from people who've passed this way. But I love this sign. This is the classic sort of trail crossing sign on the highway and somebody's drawn a little heart. <laughs> and you know it's like that. Um, wonderful Roman bridges and ancient structures, uh, lots of rivers. This is the part that looks more like Ireland than, than anything else. And Galicia is like that, it's called green Galicia. Um, and it certainly was a surprise to us. Um, the trips that we made, um, the first two trips were both accompanied by increasing amounts of rain as we got towards Santiago. And so by the time we were walking into Santiago, well, you'll see it. This is another aspect that is marvelous. 
This is something that people can miss on their way. Sometimes they go the direct route and they don't go to Samos, which is a terrible, terrible loss. Did you go to Samos? Oh dear, it's just a wonderful monastery, ancient dimension, and we went to hear the mass sung there in the evening, and it was just stunning. And this great monastery, which once, as you can see, was home to many, many monks, is now populated by five monks. Because the church has been emaciated, you know? It just isn't the way that people think anymore, and uh, the monastic tradition has uh, suffered greatly. Um, there's my little day pack, and of course you carry a staff or something like that, poles. Um, and here we are getting in the, uh, into the guts of it, coming close and in the rain. Um, and this really is the road less traveled. Although, not there, there's lots of people traveling it. <laughs> this is the great monument to Montegozo. Montegozo is the mountain of joy because from there you could see the spires of the cathedral for the first time. So you can imagine those pilgrims in the ancient days coming to the top of this hill and going, oh, wow, I made it, or I've almost made it. <laughs> Just back from Montegozo is another place called Lava Cola, which literally means wash your parts. <laughs> <laughs> Make yourself presentable for the end of the line. And here are a couple of joyous pilgrims at the end of the uh, path, coming to the end of the path, and there's the destination. But you know, as in many things that we experience in life, it's a direction, not a destination. And my friend Rick said, don't hurry, you'll only get to the cathedral. <laughs> And that's, you know, the end. Well, what fulfillment is there in that? I mean, there is great fulfillment. It's wonderful to hang around in Santiago and be with your cadre of people that have marched with you. But it's the process that is transformative and joyous. It's not the ending. Those of the, uh, who really need something, and Napoleon said that, uh, that a, an army will march a thousand miles for a bit of ribbon. And those who need that can get a compostela, which is a certificate from the church office saying, yep, you did it. But this to me, well, I haven't opened it since I got back. <laughs> but the Camino has opened me many times. Any ideas, anything that calls to you out there and says that this is why I would like to go? Those who are thinking about it, yes. Yep, very true, to slow, to slow you down and bring you in touch. This is the ultimate analog experience. There's nothing digital about it. The only thing that's become a little bit digital is sort of booking your place the next day. And there's that. But it is an actuality that is hard to deny. And uh, Anybody else had anything they wanted to offer? Reasons to go? Yes. Yeah, the, just the, the physical aspect of extending yourself and, yeah. and, and physically walking. Because I find when I walk, I process. Like my thoughts process. Yes. So, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, so it's physically walking and, and experiencing your thoughts processing. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I wrote a lot. Um, I wrote every day when I was on the Camino and I. For those patient people who read these at the other end, they um, got to kind of be with me. And I tried to write not so much about the logistics because I don't, you know, we have to talk about the logistics to get that out of the way. 
But I wanted to try and convey the mind space that we entered into. So every day, Bob and I would set a theme for the day. And this day was capacity. Hiking along, talking with Jackie through the deep byways of Galicia today, a familiar theme came up. Well, first, we're always working around the four questions. Where are you from? Where did you start? What inspired you? What do you hope to learn? Jackie's a purposeful woman, green and tan California girl. Originally Wisconsin, but like most Californians, she can't imagine now why anyone would live anywhere else. So Bob and I had set this theme for the day, capacity. The age of many ambitious peregrinos might surprise you. Sure, there are many young folks active and determined to get through in what seems like a hurry. But the predominant population is above 60. And most of those are putting a stake in the ground via the Camino. They want to make a statement. Sure, they have aches and pains. They've had heartbreaks, kids who have died, fond husbands who are incapacitated. But what about physically? The reversals mount up over a lifetime. Jackie's had her scare, her share. Cancer survivor, yep. Melanoma, don't worry, I've got lots of sunscreen on. Neck problems, several surgeries. I live in pain every day. Two days ago, I had none at all. Heaven. We toiled up a hill on a shady gravel dirt path incised into a cleft as the mid-morning birds made their concerto and the whole heavy air descended, fragrant upon us. Roses grow like weeds here, she exclaimed as we passed one, uh, yet another untended volunteer rank of pale pinks probing above the low hedge. I was really afraid of this, the long walk. When I came, worried I wouldn't make it. My sister-in-law is behind us. She has persistent knee problems. And I have my issues on top of worrying about just having the stamina and not being stopped by some injury or other. The evidence of overuse injuries all around us. Yesterday I consulted Conrad in my chambers at a morning coffee bar. He was fretting about his wife in line for the WC. They were latecomers, starters at Saria, and her knee had already acted up on a hill coming down into Porta Marin. She was no wimp and carried on, but in town that night, he got her to a physio. They gave her Voltaire, but I went one step further with my Volt Fort salve, which she dutifully slathered on. What she really has is fixable only by orthotics. Any runner knows about runner's knee. But when you work the body as hard as we are, all the hidden residuals ordinarily mask come out to test you. In my case, it's shin splints. In Bob's, it's plantar fasciitis. But surprising for Jackie, no body demons had jumped her, despite 800 kilometers. By this time, the cumulative toll is expressing ourselves. But our latent capacity is shocking. The body can do and put up with much more than we allow. The prevailing logic, as we age, we should avoid an even longer list, an ever longer list of threats. It goes like this. If I hurt my shoulder playing tennis after years of happily enjoying it, I'm not going to play anymore. If I skied and broke a bone, that's it for skiing. Hey, it took a long time to get over that. People start creating walls against adventure, against experience. As a result, their older lives become delimited. They do less and less in the name of preservation of their ever-reducing capacity. What stops us creates unnecessary boundaries making life smaller. So Jackie and I are making a strike back against that. We weren't sure we could. But even at this age, we wanted to try to show ourselves we could, and we can. But so can many others, many, many others, who at this stage are striding or stumping, but nevertheless closing in on Santiago. So what if the bars are packed at every turn? Tia Dolores, which means place of sadness. Um, the compere emerges with a great big shepherd's crook and a cloak uh, to pose with the hikers, jolly and given, giving. Along the stone wall leading away, the path dip, dappled in the sunlight, a lineup of their empty craft beer bottles. I mean, this gives new dimension to the old 99 bottles of beer on the wall. <laughs> So there's lots of character and joy still flowing in those who are expanding their capacity, starting from wherever. Love it. To those who come, like Jackie, to experience again capacity that they thought was lost to them forever. 
Along the way, they are experiencing an explosion of capacity and spirit in the relationship. Jackie has walked 800 kilometers with her sister-in-law. Her love for this imposed relationship has expanded dramatically. She knows her sister-in-law, her Camino inspiration, very well now and cares about her enormously. Their friendship is tested and true and deep. Along the way, her own peace and adjustment to a new phase of life has grown exponentially. She realized after a long period as a devoted mother, she wanted to become a better person to be with after her kids had flown. She wanted to be a better wife, a better friend, a better relative. What a lovely benediction to take into later life. On Mother's Day, which she experienced alone over here, she realized that she would have to adapt to her grown kids' reality. Go where they are now. Do what they do. It was her gift to herself. Bob and I have found that our capacity to have fun together, to learn from each other, to forgive, and even enjoy our eccentricities and foibles has surpassed anything that we could have expected. On to Santiago. Um, I'd like to read a poem written by David White called Finisterra from his book of poems called Pilgrim. There is a tradition at Finisterra when you get to the end that you uh, leave something behind that you brought along. And uh, so David wrote this poem about his daughter's Camino. And they were at Finisterra, which is the end of the world. That's what Finisterra means. And uh, standing by the seashore, um, and she put her boots down. That's the end for those. Um, the road in the end, taking the path the sun had taken into the western sea, and the moon rising behind you as you stood where ground turned to ocean. No way to your future now, but the way your shadow could take. Walking before you across the water, going where shadows go. No way to make sense of a world that wouldn't let you pass, except to call an end to the way that you had come. To take out each frayed letter you brought, and light their illumined corners, and to read them as they drifted through the western light. To empty your bags, to sort this and leave that. Promise what you needed to promise all along, and to abandon the shoes that had brought you here right at the water's edge. Not because you had given up, but because now you would find a different way to tread. And because through it all, part of you could still walk on over the waves. Thank you. <laughs>